our atmosphere is a lot thinner than it looks. When we look up at the sky, it's very easy to imagine it being a limitless expanse. But seen from space, you can quickly understand how little atmosphere we really have. In fact, it would take you about two hours to drive into space if you could drive vertically upward. Think about that for a second. Two hours drive, well, the Earth is nearly 13,000 kilometers in diameter, and yet we only have just a very thin atmosphere to protect us. So let's take a closer look at our atmosphere and understand how it's put together. It's structured in layers, and the layer that you and I live in is called the troposphere. This is where all of the weather that we are familiar with takes place. So the greenhouse effect is strongest here, and this will extend up to about 20 kilometers until we get to the stratosphere. So this is the altitude at which commercial jets operate. And at this altitude, the temperatures are pretty much down to freezing year round. There's a layer in the stratosphere called the ozone layer. This is where most of those ozone particles collect. And as we're going to learn later on, uh, it's responsible for keeping the ultraviolet radiation from striking much of the surface of the Earth. Further up, we have the mesosphere. And when we get beyond the mesosphere into the thermosphere, now we are, for all intents and purposes, approaching or even in outer space. In fact, this is what we think of as the upper atmosphere. And you can see we have meteors, shooting in. So this is where these objects from space are encountering the atmosphere. They're heating up and burning up, producing these brilliant shooting stars. And about 100 kilometers above the surface is the dividing line between Earth and space, at least by international agreement. In fact, there are still particles of atmosphere, even at this altitude and much higher. The thermosphere contains what's known as the ionosphere, and it is at this altitude that the International Space Station orbits. Now, you don't really think of the space station or satellites as still in the Earth's atmosphere, and that's because the Earth's atmosphere does not have an official cutoff line, even though we've defined one at 100 kilometers up. And that's why whenever a ship visits the space station, boosts are conducted. The ships will fire their engines, to help boost the station up just a little bit to maintain its orbit. The composition of our atmosphere is, well, mostly air, but what is air? Our air consists of mostly nitrogen with some oxygen, and then we have a little bit of argon and then some so-called trace gases. Uh, the gases are going to be things like dihydrogen monoxide, Okay, water, fine, whatever. Uh, also some carbon dioxide, methane, etc. So these are the volatile materials, largely brought to us via comets and asteroids when the Earth was still forming, and also are still outgassed today by volcanoes. So let's talk a little bit about that cycle of how oxygen, carbon, and so forth are recycled through our atmosphere. So we start off here with uh, a volcano somewhere in the Pacific, and it releases water, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen, etc., are all being blown out by volcanoes. So the water will fall as rain. It's going to bring some of that carbon and sulfur dioxide back to the surface. Uh, plants will absorb CO2 and then release oxygen back into the atmosphere as a byproduct. The rest of it uh, is dissolved into the ocean. So it makes its way into limestone, sediments, rocks at the bottom of the ocean, and remember, below the bottom of the ocean, there is the mantle of Earth. So some of that is being trapped in the rocks, and the rocks are in the tectonic plates, which are then subducted underneath, deep into the mantle, and they melt. And so when they melt, if they find themselves being liberated once again via a volcano, we can set up a little bit of a cycle going on here. So this is how the Earth kind of regulates its own carbon dioxide and oxygen levels in the atmosphere naturally. All of this combines to form our climate, and we can just define our climate as those conditions that result in weather. So what's the difference between climate and weather? Well, you know, as something easy to remember is that climate is what you expect, weather is what you get.
You don't expect it to snow in uh, the Nami Desert in Namibia. You don't expect uh, a heat wave in the Swiss Alps and so forth. We have a certain expectation of what weather is going to be like around the globe based upon what the climate is like in different areas. So what is it that drives weather? Well, the primary driver of weather is energy from the sun. So these are going to be uh, seasonal changes. We learned before that as Earth moves around the sun, because of its axial tilt, we get a little bit more sunlight in one hemisphere and a little bit less sunlight in the other hemisphere at different times of the year. So these daily and seasonal variations are going to set up weather patterns. And the Earth rotates, so it distributes that changing energy from the sun around, and we can really just say that weather is effectively just a response to the changing energy input from the sun. Now, the atmosphere of Earth has a fair amount of oxygen in it, about 20% of oxygen. But if you've ever left out a tool outside and let it rain, you know that it rusts. And that's because oxygen is a very reactive molecule. Once it combines with something else, it oxidizes it. It basically rusts it out. And when you look around Mars, there's very little oxygen in its atmosphere. And that's because it's all settled onto the surface, literally covering everything in a kind of, kind of a rust. And so why is it that whenever we look around Mars, there's largely a rusty surface and yet Earth has even more oxygen and, well, everything seems to be pretty nice around here. Well, the answer is due to life. Life is what's bringing oxygen back into the atmosphere. And here is a plot of the percentage of present day oxygen levels. So starting at zero, going all the way up to 100 on the y-axis and dating backward from billions of years ago. And you could just see what a dramatic increase we've seen in the amount of oxygen levels. So the first oxygen was released by cyanobacteria, maybe about 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, then uh, the first eukaryotes were formed, and now we have a little bit more sophistication and therefore a little bit more oxygen being released. Multicellular organisms evolved uh, around 2.1 billion years ago. But it wasn't until the arthropods showed up about 800 million years ago that we really saw an explosion in the output of oxygen. And as plants, reptiles, and other organisms evolved onto the land, uh, the Earth's oxygen levels reached to what they are today. And all of this was made possible due to a greenhouse effect, which keeps the Earth warm. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what the greenhouse effect is and how it works. First, let's just imagine a simple case where Earth has no greenhouse effect. So it either has no atmosphere, or if you like, you can imagine an atmosphere with just air in it, but none of these greenhouse gases. Let's see what would happen. Well, energy from the sun would rain down on the Earth, and it's going to come in the form of visible sunlight, with maybe a little bit of UV, but otherwise it's visible sunlight. Well, this has the effect of warming the surface. So the surface absorbs that light and then it warms up and it radiates infrared. So the infrared uh, radiation is sent directly out into space and what happens is the amount of energy that gets radiated ultimately equals the amount of energy coming in. This is known as equilibrium, a thermal equilibrium. So our equilibrium temperature would be at about 255 Kelvin that's actually quite cold. That would take us down to uh, a little less than zero degrees Fahrenheit. And so if we didn't have a greenhouse effect, we'd be living on snowball earth. Okay, so this greenhouse effect is responsible for about a 35 Kelvin increase. Okay, so let's see what the greenhouse effect itself does. As before, we have the sun ray absorbing the earth, but now we have an atmosphere that contains some of these greenhouse gases. So Sunlight comes to the surface. It warms up the surface. Infrared radiates back into the atmosphere. However, some of the greenhouse gases absorb some of that infrared. 
and it radiates that infrared into all directions. The rest gets radiated into space, but for the stuff that gets absorbed, it gets re-radiated in all directions, and it has the effect of warming up the ground even more. So it heats up the ground further. So now the ground gets a second warming of infrared, and it warms up a little bit more, so it re-radiates that, and some of that gets re-radiated in space, the rest of it gets absorbed and reflected back to the surface. So what happens is eventually the amount of energy coming off the surface of the earth into space once again will equalize the amount of energy coming in from the sun. Therefore, we get a, we get a new higher equilibrium temperature. In other words, the greenhouse effect takes the earth from snowball to a very habitable and comfortable place to live that we have today. However, we're changing the greenhouse effect, or rather, we are intensifying the greenhouse effect, and we're going to talk about that next. <laughs> 